Hey guys, Vlad here with AVT Astro. And as you can see, it's a little hard to hide what we're talking about today, right? And that is Takahashi APO Refractors. For those of you that might not be familiar, I run a little Astro blog called avt-astro.com and of course this YouTube channel. So if you're not subscribed, please do consider subscribing. Over the years, I've had the privilege of owning over a hundred scopes, more accessories than I can count. So I'm kind of an astro nerd, I'll admit it. All right, so for those of you guys that have been in the hobby for a while, I mean, you know what Takahashi is. Chances are if you're watching this video, you know what it is, or maybe you're thinking about buying one. That's kind of why I wanted to do this video, just kind of give you my thoughts of them, because obviously, you know, I own a few of them. Uh, and I've actually owned a couple of different models that I'll kind of touch on later. So anyway, I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about the history of Takahashi just because it's going to kind of, you know, help explain, you know, why they do some of the things that they do to this day. So Takahashi was originally founded in 1932. So, I mean, you know, think about that. It's almost 100 years old as a company. They were founded, interestingly enough, as a sand casting company. If you're not sure what sand casting is, it's just basically a way of, um, you know, essentially forming metal. Uh, if you're curious about it, you know, look it up. We'll not get too deep into that. Um, anyhow, um, shortly after World War II, they got into making optics and they made their first telescope um, in uh, 1967. That was an achromatic telescope. Uh, shortly afterwards, in uh, 1969, they made their first APO telescope. So, I mean, think about that. Most people think that APOs, you know, they're kind of a new phenomenon. I mean, they really took off, I would say, like in the early 2000s, is, you know, when kind of like the APOs became pretty prevalent. Um, but, I mean, they've been around for a while. And Takahashi, I mean, these guys are the pioneers of this. So, you know, you got, you got to really give them credit for that. All right, so with the history out of the way, with the intro out of the way, let's get to the topic of the video. Takahashi APO telescopes, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So as the topic might imply, you know, this isn't gonna be just like a total, you know, like fanboy, you know, praising of the telescopes, right? I just wanna give you guys my honest kind of overview of what I think is really good about them and, you know, some of the stuff that's not so great about them. I mean, obviously I own a number of them, you know, so I do like them. So uh, yeah, let's get down to it. So I'll start off with the good and um, you can see my list. There's a lot more goods than uh, not goods, okay? So the very first thing we'll get out of the way, okay, um, what makes these telescopes so desirable and so popular and so highly regarded is the optics. The optics on these guys, from what I understand, are actually made by Canon. Um, they, you know, I've used, to just to kind of not make this, you know, 14 hours long, I've used all the premium brands, essentially, or most of the premium brands. I've used uh, Russian Lomo lenses, I've used Tech, uh, Astrophysics, uh, these guys, and, you know, they're right up there with the best, you know, I mean, I wouldn't really say, like, when you're up to that higher, you know, premium tier, that, you know, there's one, you know, supreme scope above them all, um, I mean, like, like this TSA, for instance, you know, amazing sharp optics, I'd say, I'd say it compares very favorably to uh, my Astrophysics 130 GT. Uh, the FS 128, it's got one of the best contrasts I've ever seen out of any telescope. The FSQ 106, I mean, it's highly regarded as one of the best astrographs out there. Um, or if you're into visual and you enjoy a uh, you know, really wide, f uh, flat field, you know, it's awesome for that as well. So optically, I'd say that's absolutely 100% their strongest suit. I mean, they are excellent, excellent optical scopes. So that is, you know, they're by far their greatest strength. All right, so next thing, brand recognition. You know, you could take out a Takahashi telescope, you know, and again, like if you take it to a star party or, you know, somewhere where there's other amateur astronomers, I mean, man, like pretty much everybody knows what a TAC is. You take that thing out. Actually, kind of an interesting story. Um, I had my, uh, when I first got my first FS120, this actually my second one. Um, I took it to a star party. Uh, it was sitting on an NGP mount. I'll post in the picture of that right now. 
And man, like it was like, <laughs> like literally like I took out like a neutron star, right? Everybody just kind of gravitated over to the setup, you know, just to kind of check it out. I mean, they're, you know, they're pretty impressive scopes. I mean, they do definitely have a presence. So if you're after a telescope that performs very well optically and you want brand net recognition, whether it's, you know, just for yourself, um, you know, whether you want other people to easily recognize that it's an awesome scope, um, or maybe even for resale value. I mean, Takahashi brand recognition is absolutely, you know, at the top of the list, I would say. All right, so next thing I have on my list is availability. Um, if you're shopping for a high-end APO telescope, you probably already know. I mean, you can't just like call uh, Astrophysics and be like, hey, you know, send me a 130 GTX and you know, they'll, they'll have it at your door, you know, in like a week. I mean, the wait list is about 4 million years long, you know? <laughs> and that's actually true about quite a few of the premium brands. I mean, they're not quite as long of a wait list as uh, Astrophysics, but they do usually have a wait list. These things, I mean, you can literally go online and order most of these, you know, pretty readily available. I mean, right now we're still, you know, at the making of this video, we're still kind of like at the tail end of the pandemic, hopefully anyway. <laughs> so availability might be a little bit tighter on some of the scopes, but generally, I mean, you could just, you know, go to any or like, you know, Takahashi America, order one of these and it'll probably have it in like a week. So availability is definitely, you know, one of the really Really, really strong suits especially in the premium brands all right so the next thing that i have in the good category is weight um that's not to say that these things are super lightweight i mean you know they're they're you know a good to good uh, decent weight telescope uh, but i'd say just overall they are a lighter weight uh, uh you know in the premium brands so if weight is your kind of like your uh, ma major consideration i mean do look up the weights of you know whatever scopes you're considering uh but takahashi you know generally they're a pretty light uh, telescope all right so the next uh, thing that i have is price in the uh, good category you might be like wait a second vlad like what <laughs> <laughs> what planet are you from, right? Like Takahashi isn't cheap. And that's not what I'm trying to say. They're not cheap, uh, but they're competitively priced, especially, you know, considering that they are actually available. Um, and you could find some really good deals on the used market. So if you're okay, you know, buying used, you know, check out Astromar, check out Cloudy Nights. Um, I mean, they do come up for sale, you know, fairly often, I'd say, decently frequently. Um, so yeah, you can get some pretty awesome deals on them used. And kind of, you know, closely linked to that is resale value. I mean, you buy one of these, right? Um, and you know, let's say you buy one of these new. I mean, you're not losing like, you know, a huge portion of your investment. And over time, they really do hold their value. So resale value is, is good on them. But I'd say that's true about like any of the uh, premium brands. All right, so that kind of gets uh, concludes everything that I had on the good uh, part of the list, right? So now we're getting to the bad part of the list, right? And this is where all the fanboys are starting to reach for the raw tomatoes, right? They're, you know, they're kind of, you know, getting them ready, right, to throw at me. But, you know, if, I think most people, if they're honest, you know, with themselves, they'll kind of probably agree with most of this stuff. So here it goes. Now, the, uh, so uh, the first thing that I have in kind of like the bad, you know, portion is the focus around these things. Um, that kind of goes back to the history of the company, which I kind of really do respect. I mean, so their primary business was Sandcast, and I think they're still in the Sandcasting business in general. So, I mean, all of these me uh, metal parts on the telescope, right, that includes the focuser on all of these guys, right, they're Sandcast. So, they, you know, they make the stuff themselves, which I really respect. I mean, that's really cool. I do appreciate that. Um, unfortunately, the way that, you know, I guess sand casting works, it just, it's just not precise enough to make a good focusers from what I understand. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not like a focuser engineer or anything like that. Uh, like for instance, this TSA actually has a pinion upgrade with a feather touch, you know, pinion. And, you know, increase, it improves the focuser, you know, a decent amount. But there's still like, you know, when I move the coarse adjustment screw, there's still like, I don't know, like half a millimeter at least of play, um, like in that rack and pinion assembly. So um, their focusers, I mean, they're not bad, like especially like their stock focusers, but 
I mean, for a premium scope, they're also not good, I would say. <laughs> I mean, I'd say, you know, at best for the price that you pay for these scopes, they're acceptable. So the focuser is definitely something, um, while it's not terrible, it's, it's just not up to the, to the par of the telescope, essentially. All right, so the next one in the bad category, and this is actually the last one in the bad category, uh, and I don't think that anybody's going to disagree with me here, uh, is the price of the accessories. Takahashi accessories are pretty notoriously expensive, so their scopes, like I said, I'd say are actually a pretty good value, I mean, even if you're buying a new. Their accessories, I mean, they're just kind of, you know, I'd say astronomically priced. So, you know, take that for what it is. So if you're considering buying one of these, I mean, look into all the other accessories that you're going to put into this. Um, and yeah, now naturally you can use aftermarket accessories. Like these are not Takahashi rings. That's not a Takahashi finder. Uh, but overall, like, you know, a lot of people do enjoy like putting a, together a complete Takahashi package. And if you, you know, if you want to do that, it is going to cost you. All right, so now we're getting to the ugly, to the last category. Not, not thankfully, not very many <laughs> things in this category. And really, it's only one thing that's in that category. But I'll start with another one that's kind of specific, actually, to the FSQ and to a couple of their other models. I've heard like the Sky 90, I think. Uh, FSQs, uh, whether it's like the 106 or the Baby Q, the 85. Um, I mean, they do have optical issues with like, cause it's a, it's a four uh, optical element design, right? And they have issues with them getting misaligned or I don't, I don't know what the technical thing is. Um, the, so that's kind of not really that great on a premium scope, right? Like to me, like the, one of the things that makes a refractor a refractor is that, I mean, the optics should be bulletproof on this man. Like as far as the, like the alignment, you shouldn't have to go tweak that ever, right? Um, unfortunately, with FSQs, it's not like if you read the forms, not uncommon for these guys to have like alignment issues. Uh, and what makes it worse, I mean, I, I wouldn't consider that to be too bad, but what makes it really bad is uh, if it's an actual true alignment issue. From what I understand, it's a trip back to Japan uh, to get them realigned. So, I mean, to me, that's just like a really big downer. Like, the, it, it just doesn't scream premium to me. I mean, having said that, again, that only affects a couple of the models, like most of the models really don't have that issue, and it's not a trip back to Japan, actually, if you, you know, if you did want to get the optics clean and recollimated, uh, Takahashi America can do that here in the United States. All right, so with that out of the way, as far as the optics goes on the FSQ, which, you know, I do consider to be a really big downside, or potential downside anyway, is the one thing that I really truthfully do not enjoy about the telescopes. And you're like, what, is, what are you talking about? Well, I mean, look at these things. I mean, they're, you know, they're beautiful works of art, right? And I agree. But the one thing that I really kind of have an issue with them is their paint quality. To me, on a premium telescope, really none of them should have paint on them. Paint that, especially what that Takahashi uses, I mean, it chips off incredibly easy. Pretty much any Takahashi, with I think the exception of the FS128, which is like museum um, basically condition, I mean, they all have chips on them, man. Like, it's it's amazing. Like, this paint that they use, it's, it's not, I don't know if it's cheap paint or if they just don't know how to spray or whoever sprays it for them. I mean, it's sprayed on beautifully, but it just, it's, just, it's not very durable at all. To me, on an expensive telescope, on a premium telescope, they should really all be powder coated. If you're not familiar with what, what powder coating is, look it up, but basically it's a much, much, much more durable finish. A lot of the premium brands like Tech, uh, Astrophysics, I think Stellar View, uh, they use powder coat, and I mean the stuff, you can't scratch it, it's much, much more difficult. It basically will not chip off. It's essentially a permanent finish. I mean, it's much, much more durable than, you know, this the stuff that Takahashi uses on their telescopes. The other thing that I'd say is a lot better about powder coat too is typically, I mean, it doesn't have to be, but typically it'll be a textured finish, kind of like the sand casting portions of the uh, Takahashi. Uh, which if you do, because to me, a premium scope, it's a lifetime telescope. Like, you know, you buy it and it'll last you a lifetime because it's the best, right? Uh, so if you do happen to get a chip on like let's say your astrophysics somewhere in the powder coat which again is pretty hard to do but let's say you do very easy to touch it up with touch a pen you won't ever even see it 
Uh, the smooth uh, surfaces that they, you know, do with paint, I mean, it's beautiful, right? But, I mean, there's no way you're going to touch that up and not see it. I'm, I'm, I'm posting in, like, a little uh, thing of, you know, what a touch-up looks on the TSA here. Um, it's just, you know, you're not going to make it look good. And keep in mind, I used to be a pro auto detailer in a previous life. Alrighty guys, so hopefully you guys found that video interesting. I mean, overall, just to sum it up, uh, just real quick, uh, Takahashi, excellent, excellent optics. I love that they're available. You could go and order one like right now and probably have it in a week. So those are very, very, in the premium brand category, very, very good things. Uh, focuser, again, that is a downside. You can retrofit a feather touch on here. And really to me, like if you're gonna keep one of these for the rest of your life, it's just like, you know that that's your telescope. I probably would go ahead, you know, and put a feather touch on them. That really kind of, um, makes the telescope more premium to me. Uh, the paint you're just gonna have to deal with. I mean, it's just it's just not very good quality paint, does chip easily. Um, but otherwise, I mean, just overall, they are an awesome scope. Every single time I have one of my Takahashi's out, I really enjoy using them. So anyhow, if you guys have any questions, comments, or anything like that, leave them in the thing below. If you're not subscribed, please do consider subscribing. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.